reason systems have certainly evolved, just look at the first generation all the way up to the current one. But what about when a game series itself evolves? I'm talking about the Jack series specifically, when you see a series evolve and evolve quickly. Yeah, Mario and Sonic have evolved as well, but that was more of a forced evolution as they were long-running series and gaming icons that had to change with technology. But the Jack series is different. This is more of a natural evolution, as while each game changes as the story builds and each game is not self-contained like most games and their sequels, each game in the Jack series picks up right where the last one left off, or at least relatively close to. And the main reason why the Jack series evolves over the course of its three games is because of the very immersive and very very epic storyline. Jack and Daxter started development in 1999. Only two programmers were working on it at the time, as other staff members were working on Crash Team Racing. When the PS2 was released, the rest of the team joined in and started working on the game. Over the course of three years, they made various tweaks to the game engine so that there were no load times or fogging, allowing you to see other levels in the distance as clear as crystal. It was very rare to see a game that used CDs as its physical media to not have any loading screens when transitioning from area to area. Some games did a really good job of hiding the loading screens like Spyro the Dragon or Ratchet and Clank. Actually, Jack and Daxter has a bit of a tell when it's loading. Whenever Jack slows down when he's running, that's when you know it's loading something. The technique is called dynamic loading, where certain techniques are used to hide the fact that the game is loading in the background. The most obvious type is elevators like in the first Mass Effect or things that can be referred to as speed bumps, like in Metroid Prime when you hit a door and it takes a few seconds to open. More and more games use this technique to give a seamless transition from place to place to get rid of those archaic loading screens, because a loading screen really does ruin immersion, although there are times when dynamic loading fails, causing the game to lock up. So what type of game is Jack and Daxter? Well, it's a collectathon like Banjo-Kazooie, except for the story is much deeper. There's probably going to be some comparisons here. Jack is Banjo, the guy who does a lot of the work, Daxter is Kazooie, the wisecracking sidekick, the precursor orbs are those musical notes, and power cells are jigsaw pieces which are needed to advance throughout the game. You get power cells for doing missions for NPCs or from just finding them strewn about the area, like in Banjo-Kazooie. I know that other platform games before Banjo-Kazooie have done better, but that game had a certain uniqueness to it, and Jack and Daxter has a very similar feel to it. I looked to see if the game was inspired by Banjo-Kazooie during development, but turned up nothing. I'm dead serious. Play Banjo-Kazooie and then play Jack and Daxter, they feel almost identical. Now, do not take that as a criticism. In fact, it's a compliment. Banjo-Kazooie is a great game, and the Collectathon platform game is a necessary one to every console as long as it's done correctly. And it should be easy to do as it's a basic type of game, although Bubsy 3D has proven that it's incredibly easy to screw up this genre. Now the controls are a little loose and that's a good thing for this type of game as it allows you to leap and bound along platforms very fluidly. In some areas it can be a little problematic, mainly in confined corridors where there's a lot of small platforms like in the Lost Precursor City. And when jumping, Jack feels like he loses momentum and it's a little bit more noticeable when he double jumps. Although I wouldn't call pulling your knees up to your chest a double jump. Now, I said that it feels like Jack loses momentum when jumping. That does not mean that he does. It just feels like he slows down. The double jump gives you almost no additional height, but does give you a bit of extra distance. It almost feels like the double jump is pointless and would be more efficient to have a single jump with a max set height and distance that depends on momentum. You also get a high jump if you crouch down, then jump, or a long jump if you hit the crouch button while running, and then jump while rolling. You can perform a thrusting punch with a square and turn it into an uppercut if you jump during the middle of it. And Circle will do a spin attack similar to Crash Bandicoot. And when Jack spins, it looks like he's smashing enemies with Daxter, which makes using it oh so satisfying. Daxter is pretty annoying as a character. But well, he's meant to be the comic relief, but there's times you wish he would just stop talking. And each time you die on the ground, Daxter will shove his face in the camera and say something stupid and during cutscenes, he annoys the other characters. Kira's voice is a little grating on my ears and her voice doesn't match how the character looks, which I find to be important, because that makes the character all the more believable. I like Samos as he's the only character that puts Daxter in his place every time he gets too annoying. Now I do like Daxter, but not in the large doses that were given in this game. And I know that someone is going to say that he develops more as a character and plays smaller roles in the later games, but we'll get into character development towards the end. In terms of story, it's pretty basic. Jack and Daxter go to an area where they're not supposed to go, Daxter falls into a pool of dark eco, which hurts or kills you in the game, but here it turns Daxter into a creature called an Otzel, a hybrid of Otter and Weasel. There's other types of eco as well, green for health, blue to move faster, yellow for fireballs, and red makes you stronger. The story goes from a quest to turn Daxter back to normal, to saving the red, blue, and yellow sages from Gull, the dark sage, and his sister Maya. 
Overall, it's a pretty basic story, nothing too complicated, and can be enjoyed by everyone. But when Jack 2 and 3 come about, this story gets a lot more complicated, but that's for later. The game is pretty long as you need to collect power cells, by either finding them or getting them from NPCs to continue the story. And you'll be traveling across the entire game world collecting them. There seems to be a leap in difficulty when you hit the second village as some of the areas just punish you if you mess up in the slightest like the Lost Precursor City, which I found to be very unforgiving for the most minor of slip-ups. But you do get infinite lives, so death is a minor setback more than anything. The camera is probably the only true problem I found with this game. You can zoom in and out and spin it around, but you can't pan it downward to make judging the space between gaps or enemies easier. Before I give my final score, I'm going to talk about how this game has aged. I rarely talk about how the game I'm reviewing has aged. It's not the driving force of my decision, but more of a background influence, and starting from now on, before I close a review, I will talk about how a game has aged. So how has Jack and Daxter aged? The answer is... Not that well. Jack and Daxter is a collectathon game with an entertaining story and good gameplay, but the collectathon game never ages well because you subconsciously know where everything is when you go back and play it. That's not a strike against this game, it's a strike against the genre. Collectathons, like point and click adventure games, are pretty much a one and done type. A collectathon platform game is important because it usually gets a system rolling and is targeted towards everyone. I love Jack and Daxter, the gameplay is fun, the characters are awesome, and the writing is funny, and the animation is amazing. But this is the third time that I've played the game, and this was just for the review, and I don't see myself playing it any more times than that. Maybe in 10 years I might play it again for nostalgia purposes though. Like Banjo-Kazooie, it's a fun game, but how many times can you play a game where the premise is to collect things? Like I said, it's pretty much a one and done type of game, unless you're into speedruns. And now that Jack and Daxter is out of the way, we can dive into Jack 2 where they changed up the formula for the gameplay. I had gotten Jack and Daxter with my first PS2, but I left the system and game behind when I went off to college. I picked up a second PS2, but I wouldn't play Jack 2 until a few years after its initial release when I picked up used copies of the trilogy around 2006. When I had the games in my possession, I played them all from start to finish and enjoyed every second of it as each game was better than the last. Naughty Dog originally wasn't sure if they were going to make a sequel to Jack and Daxter. However, in that game, if you collected all the power cells, you would get a secret ending that sets up a sequel. And I'm so glad that they ditched the collectathon gameplay for a more action oriented and story driven type of game. But a lot more than the gameplay was improved upon, like the graphics, first of all. The game looks a lot better and the new character models allow for for a lot more animation and the new faces allow for a much wider range of emotions to be shown. The new models are a lot smoother and not as jagged. This is especially noticeable with Daxter whose face isn't painted on anymore. The sound is also more refined than the previous games. It's more crisp and easier on the ears than some of the sounds in the previous game. Kira's voice is a lot better on this one. It's the same voice actress, but it sounds like she gotten better. And now to move on to the gameplay, which is vastly different from its predecessor, and it's very nice to see that it is. Gone is the eco that you'd use for combat or puzzle solving, which is nice because it sucks having to work with time limits for a good portion of the game. And having to collect 50 small green eco just to recover 1 out of 3 hit points is ridiculous, especially when it feels like you're getting hit with cheap damage. Instead of getting 3 hit points, you get 8, and health pickups are pretty plentiful. You usually finding one or two in boxes that are scattered across the levels, so you can last a lot longer than you could in Jack 1. And this is needed as there's a lot more enemies than there were in the previous game. Now the core platforming and melee combat is improved upon. It's a lot smoother and feels more natural and not as loose as the previous title. While Jack 1 was a little loose when it came to controls which helped with platforming smoothly, Jack 2 gets rid of that loose feeling and gives you a more natural feel, allowing you to make more precise jumps and attacks. Jack can still do that lunging punch and turn it into an uppercut and a spin attack and he retains all of his other moves from Jack 1. In addition to melee combat, you get the morph gun, which is nice to have a long range weapon. But it does feel like it has all the power of a pea shooter in the beginning, but you do get weapon upgrades. In Jack and Daxter, I talked about how the jump and double jump felt like there was a loss of momentum. Well in Jack 2, they fixed that. Jack keeps the same momentum jumping and double jumping. So despite the fact that I still can't pan the camera downward, I'm not too worried about my jumps coming up short. The camera is a little bit more intelligent in this one and doesn't get stuck on things as often as it did in the previous game. Jack 2 doesn't really have that dynamic loading that its predecessor had, but instead it has speed bumps. When you transition from area to area, there's doors that take their sweet time to open. That's this game's version of loading screens. It's a step backwards from the previous game, however, it really does add to the atmosphere of this dystopian city. Especially when the doors open and you see how desolate the world of Jack and Daxter has become. It's not a matter of where they are, but a matter of when they are. And yes, I realize of how much of a time-traveling douchebag thing that is to say. If you collected 101 power cells in Jack 1, you get a secret ending, where Kira, Samos, Jack, and Daxter are testing out a Rift Rider and Precursor gate. They activate the machine and it ends there. Jack 2 picks up at this moment. A bunch of creatures come out of the portal and the four characters are flung through the gate and the Rift Rider is destroyed. Jack and Daxter arrive in a city where Jack is immediately kidnapped and taken 
taken to jail. While Daxter escapes, he vows to rescue him before he knows it. Apparently, before you know it, is two years later. During the time of Jack's imprisonment, he's subjected to dark eco experiments in an attempt to make him some sort of super soldier. Daxter rescues him and they escape the prison and start doing missions for the underground, a resistance movement dedicated to overthrowing Baron Praxis, who Jack wants to join to get revenge on for being subjected to as an experiment. From here, the game is mainly mission-based, but there's no power cells to collect to progress the story, so you won't be wandering around looking for those stupid things just to get to the next area and to advance the plot. All missions are required to advance the game, even when some of them have no significance to the story, like the jet board racing. And the game is extremely unbalanced when it comes to difficulty. This is one of the worst difficulty curves I've ever seen in a game. The game just spikes and plummets in difficulty all throughout the game. 20 minutes in, you have to blow up an ammunition for us, and it's the fifth mission, and it's a total pain because you see it through the point of view of the machine that's chasing you, making it difficult to judge distances while platforming. You screw up in the slightest, just restart. And the checkpoints are far and few between. I've come close to the end of a mission, died, and then had to start over from the beginning. Then you have to make a delivery to crew, while being chased by the Crimson Guards, and if the zoomer you're on is destroyed, you have to start over again. But after that, the missions get pretty balanced, but certain ones will still jump in difficulty again and again. And some of these missions leave no margin for error. If there's any failing point in this game, it's the vehicle sections. These are the worst vehicle controls I have ever had the displeasure to use. The first problem I have with the vehicles is that they feel very floaty. Yes, I realize how stupid of a statement that is considering that all the vehicles are hovercrafts, but there's not much of a sense of control. I found myself hitting the walls constantly and needing to constantly tap the acceleration just to control it, which doesn't help when you're on a time limit or needing to win a race. The vehicle sections in Jack 1 controlled a lot better, and navigating the city doesn't help with all these small areas filled with tons of other vehicles and Crimson Guard patrolling the area, and they give you missions that you can't skip and have no major importance to the story, and they are vehicle missions that are on a strict time limit. And the Crimson Guard only seem to care when you start the mission, otherwise they don't care at all. I can literally walk into one and nothing will happen, but the second I get on the zoomer, all hell breaks loose. It adds unnecessary and unfair difficulty to a mission that's pointless. The perfect example of how terrible these sections are is when you have to collect money for crew. This mission needs to be done perfectly. You have 30 seconds or less to collect bags of money which are scattered about. Why is there a time limit on these? If they've already been sitting there, then why the rush? And why are the Crimson Guard on my tail? They didn't care what I was doing before. And they'll ram into you head on after you hijack a car before you even have a chance to go down to the ground level. And this mission has no significance to the plot. It's something that should be optional. But no, every mission is required to advance through the game. Jack 1 is actually better in this aspect, as you can put in the bare minimum effort and still complete the game. That power cell too hard to get? Then skip it but you don't have that option in this game. You're in a hurry, you really don't have time to be careful, and is it necessary for the vehicles to explode after taking too much damage? Can't they just, you know, not work? As Jack does various missions in order to defeat Baron Praxis, you'll learn that Praxis is not the true ruler of Haven City, but descendants of Mars are supposed to be the rulers, and Praxis is bribing Metalheads, the main enemy of the game, to attack the city so he can enforce his rule. And that kid that you meet in the beginning of the game is the true heir to the throne. And you find out that the kid is actually Jack, who was sent back into the past with Samos, who is actually the leader of the underground, to protect and ready Jack for what was to happen to him in the future. This is a perfect example of a predestination paradox. Jack was always meant to fight Praxis and send his younger self back to the past. Praxis is killed by Kor, who is in fact the main villain and the Metalhead leader. Jack kills Metal Kor and everyone celebrates. While it does have some finality to it, Samos hints that there are more adventures ahead. When it comes to terms of how this game has aged, it's aged better than its predecessor. The platforming is much better, but I do find that the roller coaster that is the difficulty to be a hindrance to the fun that I should be having. Some of these missions are just Battletoads difficult. Haven City is huge and desperately needs a fast travel system. It really feels like most of my playtime is just traveling. The game is also extremely linear. You get a mission, travel to the other side of the city, do the mission, go all the way back, get some story exposition, and then a new mission. Alright, time to finish this. Jack 3 is the epic conclusion to the main series of games. However, this is going to be shorter when compared to the other two. It's going to be shorter for two reasons. One, nothing has really changed gameplay-wise. And two, it's the shortest game in the main series. Jack 3 is maybe about a third of the length of Jack 2. I reached the halfway point with Jack 3 in about three hours. Jack 2 took me considerably longer to get halfway through. The graphics are the same as Jack 2, but Jack's model is updated to reflect his new Wastelander status. Instead of Haven City, we're now in the Wasteland where people are banished from Haven City and sent to die, but usually end up in Spargus City where only the strong survive. Yeah, they pretty much turned the Jack series into Mad Max. I'm not even joking, Jack actually fights in Thunderdome. Like Jack 2, the core platforming is the same. 
nothing's changed. Jack still has all the same moves he had in the previous games, and you get the morph gun, only you get the upgrades much quicker. You can still turn into Dark Jack, which is something I really didn't talk about in Jack 2, mainly because I really didn't use it unless it was a dire situation where I needed to attack a lot of enemies really quickly. But I'll talk about it now. Dark Jack is a faster, stronger, melee orientated, offensive version of Jack that you can use whenever you fill up the Dark Eco meter. In Jack 3, we get Light Jack, who has a more defensive style of play, like using shields, healing, slowing time time down and flying short distances. I really don't see the use for Dark Jack. It seems kind of pointless when you have all this weaponry and ammo is pretty plentiful. I find myself using the Morph Gun about 95% of the time, mainly because the upgrades you get early on are broken, allowing for easy mowing down of enemies. You also get the Armor of Mar, which will increase your hit points by two for each piece that you acquire. They added more vehicle sections, but these are much better than the Zoomer sections from Jack 2. The cars that you get control like actual cars, and each one has its own unique handling and abilities. I have no issue with these sections, although due to Jack 2, I am very tired of seeing timed vehicle missions but these are good when you compare them to the predecessor. The zoomer sections in Jack 3 are also marginally better than Jack 2. They're not floaty and control a lot better. The only vehicle section that I had an issue with is the Leaper Lizard race in the beginning of the game. The Leaper Lizards are too precise in their handling. The slightest movement of the control stick will send you careening in that direction. If you want the perfect example of how the Leaper Lizards control, play Sonic in Sonic 06. He controls the exact same. The way you go from mission to mission has been improved upon greatly. In Jack 2, it's broken down into three parts. Step 1, you get a mission from a quest giver. Step 2, go out and do it. And step 3, go back to the quest giver and get a new one. Jack 3 eliminates that third step. You get a quest from someone, do it, then go on to the next quest giver. So all that time traveling to hand in a completed quest is cut out. The difficulty curve is also significantly fixed. There's no insanely hard missions at the beginning of the game. Well, except for the Leaper Lizard race. But there's a nice gradual increase in difficulty as the game goes on. I would rage quit constantly in Jack 2 because of the inconsistent difficulty, but it's a relief with Jack 3 that I don't have to deal with that parabolic difficulty curve. I find Jack 3 to be the easiest out of the trilogy, as you can tell that after each game they improved upon things that needed improvement. Jack 2 improved the platforming, physics, graphics, and animation from Jack 1. Jack 3 took all the good stuff from Jack 2 and improved the difficulty curve and vehicle sections. Story-wise, it comes off as a lot more simple than Jack 2, as the story is more streamlined and doesn't constantly branch off into pointless tangents which allows for more character development. The game starts off with Jack getting banished from Haven City for supposed crimes against the city. He is later found by Damus, the king of Spargus City, and then has to prove himself worthy of living in the city by fighting in the arena. Jack 3 starts off as every post-apocalyptic wasteland movie rolled into one. Jack explores the wasteland, gains the powers of light eco in the process, which helps balance out the dark eco in his body. He returns to Haven City as Ashland says he's needed. The city is a war zone because they have to deal with the metalheads that are still attacking, and they also now have to deal with the new Crimson Guard who are now being led by Errol, who was the right-hand man to Baron Praxis. Errol is in league with the Dark Makers, who are returning to the planet to destroy it. Jack has to make his way to the planet's core and turn on the planetary defense system. He's aided by Damus, who was killed in a crash, and just before he dies, he tells Jack to find his son Mar, handing him the pendant that Jack saw his younger self wearing. Jack then realizes that Damus is his father, and Damus dies never knowing that Jack was his son. This is probably one of the most tear-jerking moments in gaming history. And then Count Vagar comes in and makes it even worse for Jack. Count Vagar, the guy who banished Jack in the first place, pops up every now and then just to be a douchebag. And you learn that he kidnapped Jack as a child to use his eco-channeling abilities for his own purposes, but then lost him to the underground. Vagar, wanting to be accepted as a precursor, races to the core to become one with Jack following close behind. Jack activates the planetary defense system and at the same time meets the precursors. Who are, in a very hilarious twist, Ossels. And you learn that Eco is pretty much Ossel Spunk. You learn that Daxter is an Ossel because Eco contains the precursor genetic material. And falling into such a large concentrated amount is what turned him into one. Vagar is also turned into an Ossel because he wished to be one in Jack's place, but then regrets the decision. Jack heads to the Darkmaker ship. He destroys it, but a terraformer survives and makes its way down to the planet and is piloted by Errol. Jack destroys it and everyone celebrates. But the story does leave one question open. Is Jack the Mar of Legend? Throughout Jack 2 and 3, you hear about Mar, a legendary warrior who built Haven City. The games provide enough proof to say that Jack is Mar, but there's also an equal amount of proof that he isn't. It's possible that Jack went back in time with the Precursors and lived as Mar, making himself his own ancestor. But yet none of the statues of Mar look like him, and when he comes back, appearing behind Daxter, he hasn't aged at all. Also, and probably the biggest piece of evidence that Jack is not the Mar of Legend, Damus says that his son's name is Mar and the pendant is proof of their lineage of the House of Mar. Because Damus is such 
such a proud warrior, he would more than likely name his son after Mar. It's also possible that every couple of generations, a child is given the name of Mar and that child grows up into a legendary warrior, meaning that there are multiple Mars. Now to talk about the character development. I wanted to save this for last so this way you could see how the characters change and evolve over the course of the games. Jack himself changes the most. In the first game, we see him go from a bright-eyed and curious adventurer to a very angry person who wants revenge. Yes, he's angry, but it's also due to the dark eco in his body. And finally, in the last game, he matures and isn't as brash as he was in the previous title. And the light eco probably helps balance him out. Daxter changes as well. He starts off as a loud, obnoxious, and selfish coward. But throughout all three games, he's a very loyal friend. While Daxter is still loud and obnoxious, he gets braver and less self-centered. But that doesn't stop his ego from being out of control. Jack 3 has a very well when compared to the other two. In fact, it's the one Jack game that I would much rather play. Jack 3 has perfected everything and is what the other two should have been. The programming is perfect, the flow of the game is smooth, the difficulty curve is a gradual one, and unlike the previous games, it doesn't overstay its welcome. Jack 1 and 2 were pretty long games, especially Jack 2, but Jack 3 has a good length to it. You could pop this game into a PS3 and it would still hold up today's standards of games. That's how well crafted this game is. Jack 3 is a really good game, it's the best one out of the trilogy, but how does the entire series stand up as a whole? When I started reviewing this series, I had said that it evolved over the course of the trilogy. It started off as a platforming collect-a-thon that was not big on story, then changed into an action-orientated platformer with a story, and finally into a very story-driven, action-orientated platformer. The gameplay for a majority of it is amazing, although there are a few hiccups. The characters are very well developed, the world is very believable, the writing is amazing, and the humor is very well crafted. This is a game series that you absolutely need to play. It's not just a game, but it's an experience in how a game series can grow and evolve like a living creature. It's an incredible journey from start to finish, and despite some bumps in the road, it's a pretty fun adventure. And speaking of adventures, we're going to have a pretty fun one next week.